Hey Super Horror Fam! Being that today is a holiday, and views are generally low for holidays, there's a pretty good chance only subscribers that really enjoy the channel will see this. So I'm going to take this opportunity to share some special things with you while sharing some of my favorite Super Horror Show videos. Tonight's first video is a two sentence horror story, The Cure, originally released in 2020. I was elated in the hospital when I found out my father had regained all his memories and was able to eat and shower by himself. A week later I found him lying on the bathroom floor with exposed wires protruding out of his artificial skin. The horror genre is unique in that I feel it's the only genre that can be used like a mirror to help a viewer find out things about themselves. While watching The Cure, you probably felt something strong. But what? What was your first concern? What was your biggest concern? Were you worried the son was cheated out of time with his father? Did you worry the procedure was painful? That the father suffered? Did you want to punish the doctors that did this evil? Horror can literally reveal things about you. Maybe things you hadn't considered. Moving on, we have the creepy pasta, the dream man. Think back to when you were a child. You probably had some silly thing you were afraid of. Some ridiculous, imaginary boogeyman that haunted your nightmares. But you grew out of it. And soon enough you didn't need a nightlight to chase away the monster anymore. Except, sometimes, that boogeyman isn't imaginary. I know mine wasn't. dreaming right now, how would you know it? Would things look different? Feel different? Smell different? I mean, if it was my dream, there'd be way more horror babes around! <laughs> but even if I was dreaming, and there were horror babes around, would it really matter? After all, dreams are fake. Right? It all started when I was four or five. My parents and I lived in this old house in a small town. I didn't really have many friends in the area. So naturally, I spent most of my free time exploring the house and playing little make-believe games by myself. There was one part of the house I refused to go in though, the basement. For whatever reason, I was convinced that there was something living down there and it would get me if I ventured down there. I wasn't as wrong as you'd think. Now before I go any further, I will admit that I was a bit of a coward as a kid, so nightmares were a fairly regular occurrence. But most of the time, I could tell that I was dreaming, so I didn't make too much of them. These dreams that I'm going to tell you about were different. They felt absolutely real. And given what happened, they very well might have been. Like I said, I was just a little tyke when I started dreaming about the old man. I still remember every little detail, even today. Especially today, in fact. I remember, in the first dream, it was a beautiful summer day, and I was out and about, riding my bike in the driveway, and generally not having a care in the world. My parents were outside, watching me, and as far as I cared, everything was perfect as it could be. 
Suddenly, I felt an icy wind blow over me, and my bike just sort of locked up. I began rolling, slowly, backwards along the driveway. I was unable to slow the bike down or even get off it. I began looking around in a panic, trying to see what was going on. That's when I saw him for the first time. The old man. He was dressed sharply, like an old-fashioned nobleman. He was tall and odd. His skin was pale. He had these terrifying eyes and a disturbing smile. Being so young, I was unable to articulate exactly what I saw when I looked into the cold, dead eyes of what we came to call the Dream Man. Even as a grown man, I still can't. What I saw was simply too alien, too inhuman. Some things poor attempt at feigning humanity. I didn't waste any time as soon as I saw that horrible thing. I tried to run, but I still couldn't even manage to get off my bicycle. I turned to scream for my parents, only to find they weren't there anymore. Not that they could have done anything anyways. I slid backwards, right into the arms of the old man, his horrible eyes staring at me. I felt a freezing numbness as his long bony fingers grasped my arm, his dirty claw-like nails digging into my flesh. I remember how the old man leaned in close, breaking away from his bizarre smile just long enough to whisper one word to me. Seller. The next thing I knew, I was being shaken awake by my parents, as I had actually been screaming in my sleep. I told them about what happened, and they told me it was just a nightmare. I believed them. Every so often, I would have nightmares about the man. But since they were only dreams, my parents didn't think much of them. That is, until I started sleepwalking. As bad as my first encounter with the Dream Man was, the worst had yet to come. The Dream Man was always the same. It always started off with me in my room, playing, when I would suddenly get a sense of wrongness about my surroundings. An urgency I couldn't shake. I would go off to find my parents, but no matter where I looked, I couldn't find them. When I would go to the hallway where the door to the basement was, I would hear someone calling me. When I would turn around to see where the sound came from, the basement door would swing open, and there would be the old man beckoning me, calling me without moving his lips, locked onto me with his unblinking stare. I was powerless. I could do nothing but march towards him, screaming silently in my mind as my limbs jerkily dragged me along against my will. A prisoner to my own body. Usually at this point, I'd be woken up by my parents. Somehow, I would sleepwalk all the way to the cellar door. They almost always caught me before I started to go down the stairs. But not always. One time, the old man managed to get me down to the basement. That's the only nightmare about the dream man that I don't entirely remember. I just remember that I was in the basement with him, and he gripped my leg in his icy dead grip, that vile grin on his face. I woke up in excruciating pain. Apparently while sleepwalking, I fell down the stairs into the basement, breaking my leg in the process. After I got out of the hospital, my parents took me to see a psychologist who thought the nightmares and sleepwalking were stress-induced stating my parents' constant arguing was probably to blame. But, just in case, I was prescribed a medication to help me sleep. Naturally, after what happened, sleep was the last thing I wanted to do. And being a little kid, I tried to stay awake forever. Obviously, this didn't work. But strangely enough, the nightmare sort of subsided. I mean, sure, the old man would regularly show up in my dream terrifying me into consciousness, but he never forced me down to the basement again. So time passed, and a few years later, I was in third grade, and had even managed to make a friend. Mike. Mike and I were more like brothers than anything else. We were two of a kind, inseparable. As similar as we were, we had one major difference. Mike was completely fearless, whereas I was absolutely terrified of two specific things the dream man, 
and the basement I had come to associate with him. One day my parents gave in and allowed Mike to spend the weekend with us. We had a great time, playing video games, telling spooky stories. We even snuck into my dad's secret horror movie stash. But eventually, after all the spooky stuff we had seen and done, Mike suggested that we up the ante. We were going to go down to the basement to confront my fears. I begged Mike. I pleaded with him not to make me go down there. But he saw it as his duty as my best friend to break me free of this fear. And when Mike got an idea in his head, there was no dissuading him of it. I wish I could say what happened next was only a nightmare. It was just after midnight. We crept down the stairs into the basement, armed with flashlights and in my case, a wiffle ball bat. We spent about half an hour down there, looking in every corner for the aged ghoul who had haunted my dreams for so long. With no success, Mike smiled at me and told me I didn't have to be afraid anymore, and we decided to go back upstairs. That's when everything went to hell. Standing there, in the doorway was the dream man, every bit as horrifying as he had been in my dreams. In one swift motion, he clamped his gnarled hands around my shoulder, and with one determined motion lifted me off the ground so we were eye to eye. Those nightmarish eyes of his filled my vision. I heard screaming, but I couldn't tell if it was coming from me or from Mike. I don't remember what happened after that. The next thing I knew, I was waking up on the cold, hard floor, and Mike was huddled in the corner shuddering, wide-eyed and pale clutching the bat to his chest. For some time afterwards, I continuously asked him what happened, but he always refused to tell me. As time passed, we grew distant, as friends often do, and as Mike became more and more withdrawn, I always blamed myself. Whatever happened to us in that basement had changed him, and it was all my fault. Eventually, I stopped dreaming about the old man and I managed to put the whole thing behind me. I went to college, met a great girl. We've been married now for 10 years, and everything's pretty great. Like I said, I managed to move on, and nearly managed to forget about the dream man. Until this morning, that is. At breakfast, my son told my wife and I about a dream he had last night. A dream about an old man in the basement. An old man with cold hands and terrifying eyes. And they all lived happily ever after. The end. What a great story. Hey, do you guys know what else is great? Reading this week's top comment. Please remember to like and comment, even just to say hi. I read every comment and it really helps the channel. Okay. Ooh. This week's top commenter is Frontal Lobe. Frontal Lobe wrote, I had an encounter with a UFO, but mine was a big black rectangle. Cool story if you're interested in hearing it. It was a great story, and there's a pretty good chance it'll be animated one day, so make sure you guys are telling me all of your strange, creepy, and paranormal stories. Until next week, sweet dreams! <laughs> can be used to tell the truth to people that aren't ready or unwilling to hear it. When I first read The Dream Man, I knew I had to do it. Not because it was a creepy story, and it is a creepy story, but because I recognized it carried many of the hallmarks of a family where child abuse was happening. The child was simultaneously treated like they were crazy and told to stay out of the basement. If the parents thought nothing was going on, it's not super important to keep the child out of the basement. In fact, investigating the basement might help ease the child's mind. Some families have terrible secrets like this, and maybe someone that has suffered this way would watch the story and get to see all the comments saying how scary this was and wishing things were different for this fictitious child. And maybe they would be able to vicariously receive those kind words. 
This allowing people to experience these terrible real-world issues in a transformed, imaginative way is something you see in horror a lot. Now I could sit here for hours, pointing out different videos and stories, showing where I think you, the audience, could use the story as a mirror, or pointing out stories that are trying to share the pain and horror some people go through in life, but that would be a really long video. I don't know that anyone would watch the entire thing. So for now, we'll just leave it at these two. Before my last video, I have some things to say. I had a friend named Mike the Naked Bigfoot. He passed away on Halloween this year. He lived a full and exciting life. Some of you were lucky enough to meet him. He loved sharing and making people laugh. You can tell that because even when he was tired and uncomfortable, he still did it. You can see it in the videos on his channel. The last story I'll be sharing with you all this year will be his. My family would hide from the reality of death. When someone is sick and dying, people in my family would still talk to them, but they wouldn't say words that acknowledge the sickness, or use words like, I'll miss you. I was a funeral director, like in real life. I went to the American Academy McAllister Institute of Funeral Service. I worked in the industry for about a year, but that's a story for another day. When someone is sick, I have to say the words. I have to acknowledge they're sick, and they're loved, and they'll be missed. Mike knew he was special to me, and that he would be missed. Before his story starts, I just wanted to take a few moments to play a few short clips of him being himself. Nice to see all kinds of faces on tonight. Thank you, thank you for coming on. I want to thank everybody for tuning in tonight. I am your host, Mike the Naked Bigfoot. The views and opinions uh, belong solely to the to the host, who happens to be me tonight. If you have any small kids in the room, as always, um, and you do not wish to expose them, especially on tonight's episode. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, thank you. Heavy metal, heavy metal. Oh my God, I'm catching bits and pieces of uh, of the chat tonight, guys. So <laughs> as I'm talking, I'm trying not to be distracted. Sunday's in the house. Sunday. <laughs> you have no idea. Being active tonight, it's always fun to have an active audience. Uh, tonight's episode is going to be probably filled with a lot of bad words. <laughs> uh, I can't help but laugh because <laughs> this episode is, is going to be crazy. We play a drinking game on my show. <laughs> all my regulars, you all know the drinking game. <laughs> For those who do not know, hey Chris, hey sure. I know Amy's out there somewhere too. Shit. Super Horror Show is what I get. He's just so fucking wound up right now. I'm, I'm, I'm so excited for him. Every time you hear me say, um, that's a story for another day, or that's a story for another time, or some um, iteration of, of that phrase, please take a drink, sip, or shot of your adult beverage of choice. That's a story for another day. That's a story for another day. It's a story for another time. Do not do any of the crazy shit that I did. I mean, you can do it, but try to do it a little bit more safely. How I survived all these years, I still don't know. Amy, I still don't know, but... Hey, Papa Joey! And if you hear anything in the background, just FYI, uh, I have gone through um, several stages of freezing to death, burning up, freezing to death, and now I'm burning up again. <laughs> so I've got a fan turned on high pointed at me, so... Love you. All right. Fuck, there's something stuck to my screen. <laughs> Greetings, my children. Tonight's story comes from a very special subscriber, Mike the Naked Bigfoot. 
His channel will be in the pinned comment below. Mike has been involved in the paranormal for decades. He has some incredible stories to tell. This one came directly from his channel. I'd tell it myself, but he does it so well. Hey everyone, that's Mike the Naked Bigfoot here. As I've been posting a little bit of my social media and on Twitter, um, I've had the opportunity to assist a local paranormal team um, with an investigation. The team was called out to a home, um, very prominent, well-to-do family because the grandparents and the grandchildren had been experiencing um, some critter that was tormenting and terrifying the, the grandkids and eventually found its way into the house and was tormenting and scaring the uh, grandparents. The paranormal team, um, Hank and Melanie, what they found out when they came there to investigate, they thought it was a, a ghost or a spirit because this house is a very old pre uh, reconstruction, Southern Reconstruction house, um, but but that fell about around the, the antebellum period. It's a very large, very old house. It had been in, in this family's family and in, in their family for generations. Absolutely beautiful on a huge old piece of property. What they saw on the property, Hank and Melanie and what the grandkids described and the grandparents described on the property, um, was a small little creature with red eyes that started out scaring the kids under one of the old one of the largest old willow trees I've ever seen in my life out in the back property where the kids would go out and play in and it would pop up in the trees and hiss at them and jump down at them and they'd go running into the house screaming so naturally the, the you know their grandparents and their family thought it was like a wild possum or something they didn't think you know supernatural creature creature or a cryptid out there trying to get their grandkids well this thing found its way into the house, into, and the grandparents saw it in the hallways leading down to the where the kids would sleep at night. They saw it creeping down the hallway going towards the, the their grandkids' bedroom. And when the grandfather shouted out at it, he couldn't make out a lot of features of it. He could make out long ears, of course the red eyes, and very long fingers and arms and legs but a very squat body, and it was creeping down through the hallway. When he yelled out around it, it whirled around on him, and he saw teeth, a flash of white teeth, almost like a grin on its face. And he swore that he heard it laugh at him, this hissing laugh, and it disappeared. It just stepped back in deeper into the shadows and disappeared. It scared the hell out of him. Well, this happened. They saw it several more times in the hallway, and the kids started seeing it underneath their bed this long fingers coming out from beneath their bed trying to scare them. Um, Hank and Melanie, they got great pictures and video of scratch marks on the wooden floors and on the bedposts, supposedly made by this thing. It was three-fingered scratches across the wood and along the hallway where they had seen it walking. Um, they got pictures of the willow tree where there were long, deep, uh, gouged-in scratches onto the willow tree and scratching footprints going towards the windows of the house because the kids were seeing it outside their bedroom window before it came inside. Um, Hank and Melanie decided, they thought immediately, this is not a ghost. This is not their, their average haunting or spirit or poltergeist or residual haunting. Um, so they called the resident monster guy in to see what he thought about it. And that was me, of course, so I had my son drive me down there and I had them walk me through the property, Hank and Melanie, and I got a chance to talk to the grandparents and grandkids and um, look around a little bit. And my first assumption was it was it was definitely something supernatural, but it wasn't anything human. And just my basic walking around and listening to how this thing was sneaking through the house and sneaking across the property, 
reminded me of two things off the top of my head, and it liked to scare people. It didn't hurt anybody, but it liked to jump out and scare people. At first, I thought it would maybe have been, you know, your, your, your classic goblin, your classic fairy goblin that was out on the property. Because remember, this property is old as hell. There could be any kind of elemental living out here. My second guess um, was something called a fair, which is F-E-Y-R. Um, it's a manifest. It's it's a manifestation of um, a fear itself. It takes on the form of fe of fear. It can't hurt you, but it exists just to scare the hell out of you. And then, as I was walking around the property, the grandmother had had mirrors all over the property, all over the house, old mirrors. But one in particular caught my attention when I was walking through and I was discussing with Hank and Melanie um, what I thought it was. And I noticed this huge mirror in the, in the main sitting room that was in a silver frame, or heavily ornate silver frame. And I stopped mid-step. I felt like I was being watched. Something was watching me. It was a cold sensation that started in my arms and just flowed through my entire body. I knew something was focusing its attention on me. And I realized that whatever it was that was staring at me with such intent was coming from this mirror. And I looked at the grandmother who was with us at the time, and I asked her how long that mirror had been in the house, how long they'd owned it. She said that mirror had been hanging on that wall um, since before the Civil War. And they have owned it, and it was part of their of the family property even before that, before the Civil War. And it had been on that location ever since then. And that's when it dawned on me that I wasn't dealing with some mindless goblin or mindless fair creature. Some little trickster or something that was just there screwing around. I started to suspect it was something a lot nastier, a lot more intelligent, a lot more malevolent. But the only way for me to be sure was to... Um, open my senses and come in contact with the mirror to see if it would respond to me because I knew it was watching me me alone nobody else was feeling this I I felt like it was looking straight through me it was peering at every part of my physical and spiritual body I believe so I approached the mirror and as I got closer and closer to the mirror my face rippled in the mirror like somebody dropped a uh, drop of water on the mirror on the on a pond and i could see a ripple go across my face just one time one little ripple across my face and i reached out with my left hand and i started tracing the silver frame around the mirror itself and it was cold i felt like somebody shoved was shoving icicles in my arm my veins felt full of just absolute eyes it took my breath away for a moment and that's when I took my hand and I moved it up to the glass itself the silver glass itself and as soon as my hand made contact with that glass I felt such dark cold malevolence I came in contact with something very very dark very old could feel how old its age something that was just it had, it would never know love it never wanted anyone else to feel love I could feel that emotion shooting up my arm and in my head I heard something hiss and go you're not afraid then you need to leave 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 you're of no use to me if you're not afraid and I swear it felt like somebody punched me right between the eyes 
with a snowball. Somebody just dipped their hand in snow and made a snowball around their fist and hit me right between the eyes. And I fell flat on my ass. I, it felt like I was lying on my, on my ass for, God, hours, but it was only a few minutes. My son ran to my side to, to pick me up off the floor and get my cane back under me and everybody was gathered around me asked me what happened and I could just say don't touch the mirror and I made them take their hands off of me I didn't want anybody else touching me it was irrational how it made me feel I was terrified whatever this thing was it was it recognized me and then somewhere in the back of my head I thought, I know what this is. I know exactly what the hell this is. And that's when I looked up at Melanie and I went, Melanie, it's a fetch. And my son, who has studied some of the books and some of the lore that I've collected, he just stopped and looked at me and he said, how can that be a fetch? And I just looked at him and said, it was a fetch. It's a fetch. It's a lot worse than what everybody suspects. It's a flippin' fetch. Okay, guys, what is a fetch? A fetch is a spirit being, a creature that exists in the, in the spirit world. The next world, the, the spirit world is always uh, is adjacent to the world of the living into the corporeal world. A fetch is a shape-changing spirit. Um, it can take solid form. Usually, um, it'll take the form of, a, of another person. It'll take the form of a small animal. Um, insects, things like that. Uh, the purest definition of a fetch, though, in most lore, especially Irish folklore, fetches, when they appear before people, they usually take the form of a person and they're considered bad luck or ill fortune that will befall the person that they have taken the form of and appeared in front of. Um, to the extreme, it means that person's probably going to die when a fetch appears before them. But the fetch... As a, as a being, as a creature, um, it's far more terrifying and far more insidious and, um, than that, than some fairy tale critter. A fetch feeds off of fear. That's its primary sustenance, is what it needs fear to survive. Um, they exist to evoke fear and create fear, especially out of children. Um, because children, of course, it's easy to, easier to scare a child and to play off of their fears. And they feed off of it. Fetches, unlike a lot of other spiritual beings, um, don't need to be invited into your home to come into your home. But what they do need to get into your home and to travel, basically, from the spiritual realm into our world or into someone's house is a very highly reflective surface. It could be still water, um, chrome, hell, even a, a shiny wooden floor or linoleum. They can use a reflective surface. To them in the spiritual world, this is a window and a door where they can peer through it and see if it's worth their time coming through to feed. In the case of Goblin House, what the fetch was using was the mirror, that old, old, old mirror, to pass in and out um, of the house, out of its world into the house, to feed. It's not easy to get rid of a fetch. Leaving it alone, it just becomes more hateful. It's like it's addicted to crack. A little bit of fear is not enough. It needs more and more and more and more um, to get its fix every night. It needs more and more fear to be generated. 
I fetched us. So this thing was just not going. This was just not a a one or two times thing. This thing was going to keep coming back to this house over and over and over again, and quite possibly was never going to go away. Much like Mike thought, the fetch didn't go away easily. According to an email I received from him, it ended with me having to seal the whole house after sealing away the mirror. I got the crap scratched out of me at my house. It followed me home with friends. So I had to seal my house with my blood mixed with Grigri powder like the family's home. They tortured my dreams for weeks before I finally got rid of them. I'd never heard of a fetch before this, so this was a really special story. It makes you wonder about all the lore and legends that have existed, and that could exist now, that we're completely oblivious to. That's why I had to get permission to share it with you guys. Thank you all for being here. Remember, you are so special to me. Take good care of yourself and the people around you. If you don't have anyone around you right now, it's okay. Don't worry about it. If you take good care of yourself, people will be around you in no time. People like special things, so if you treat yourself like you're special, they'll soon come. And then you'll have people to take care of. Happy New Year, Super Horror family. Now I want to know something very important to me. Does this look like Amber Heard sniffed cocaine in a courtroom? Do you think that she was sniffing cocaine here? Dude, she was sniffing cocaine. <laughs> <laughs> she was getting so high. <laughs> oh man! I saw that. Yeah, she's snorting. There she goes. Yeah, yeah she looked. She put. She, a, she, she put looks a, around. She's like, mmm, little rosebud. <laughs> dude, she put a nickel right up her nose. I mean, <laughs>